wouldn't you know you'd find me where I'm most comfortable? In front of a diner. Now, does it look familiar? If you saw the movie Back to the Future, it should. This is a special effect called the Ultimat from New Universal Studios, Florida. Actually, just like that, see, it turns into a blue wall. Now, back again, and you can actually put yourself into a real-life movie scene just like this one. Now, what, oh my, what's that? Oh, no! Ah! Oh, my God. Now, the director of Back to the Future, among other hits like Jaws and E.T., is one of Hollywood's finest, Steven Spielberg. He's also the creative consultant to the new Universal Studios Florida. Hey, they got the best. And Richard had the pleasure of speaking with him. Yeah, yeah, hang on. Thanks, Renee. Certainly throughout so many of those pictures that you mentioned, so many of us in the audience have rediscovered that sense of uh, joy, wonder, even terror that we had as children. And the man responsible throughout so many motion pictures for rediscovering the feelings we had when we were younger, the true honest feelings of what it's like to see something for the first time is my guest right now. And I'm certainly very honored to be talking to Steven Spielberg. Thank you very much for being with us today. Nice to be here. Are you a happy guy? Yeah, generally. Yeah? Mo yeah. Most people would think you're on top of the world, top of your profession, mm -hmm. gobs of money, you're well-liked. What makes you happiest right now? I guess looking forward to the next project. I mean, I, I, my happiness is really completely interconnected with the leapfrogging I do as a movie maker. And that's been recently and totally upstaged by just my happiness as a dad, which is a new experience for me. Three and a half years old, but a new experience for me. Is that going to influence your movies at all? Well, I don't think so, because before I, I had a son, I was making movies. I was sort of fathering many stage kids along and a lot of pictures that involved children and children's uh, you know, stories about their points of view. So I feel like I've been a dad for many years, and then it finally happened for me for real. Even a dad to many adults who discover that sense of wonder again that, like they were when they were children. Michael Jackson said that when you watch a Steven Spielberg movie, you feel loved. Is there a sense of spirituality at all that you have that you communicate through your films? Well, if, if there is, it's certainly not, not, not something that I do, you know, on purpose. I don't consciously deal with that. I think filmmaking is, is, is truly a, a, a something that happens in, inside here. It's, uh, real filmmaking is not something that is where you combine formulas and mix methods, but it's just expressing yourself without knowing what you're really expressing. You just sort of like, in the few scripts I've actually written, I've always written my screenplays from beginning to end without really having much of a idea of where one scene was leading, leading to. I never really used an outline to write my scripts. I kind of started at the beginning and when it was over, it was over. One thing though that you find in all of your films is that moment when the meteor streaks across the sky and disappears. Oh yeah? <laughs> you notice that? <laughs> I noticed that. I think a lot of people do. Where did that come from? Did that come from a personal experience at all? Yes, it did. It came from when I was a child. Uh, I was five years old. My father took me to see a meteor shower one summer night where you put the blankets on the, on the hill and green grass, and you lie down with half the neighborhood, and you look up at the sky, and it was New Jersey. And I just remember looking up this at the sky. This was in New Jersey? And, yeah, it was kind of hard in New Jersey where, seeing anything. Because where were the in city New Jersey? Lights. It was in Haddonfield. In Haddonfield, yeah. And lying there uh, trying to see past the, the haze of the diffracted light from the city to the sky and there was a rather remarkable display of points of light zooming all across the sky every couple of seconds there'd be a new one and uh, I never forgot that experience. People have said a lot of your movies have got to do with a child separation from the parent and getting reunited mm -hmm. again. Do you personally have a connection to that feeling of, of being separated from someone and then reunited? Yeah, sure I do. Um, as I think many, many children and adults do who have come from broken homes. And, 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 uh, but, but by the same time, I had a wonderful childhood. And How old are you when your parents divorced? My parents divorced when I was about 15. So I had you know, 15 years of you know, being in a family, the family unit, so to speak, you know, the nuclear family in Arizona. Um, but I, I always like movies where you allow the audience to feel very small 
at one point, overwhelmed by the events they're watching, and then allow the audience to suddenly be much larger than the events and take control of the events. And I've always liked stories that do that to an audience, because those are the stories that I respond to the most. At this point, there's hardly anyone that's larger than you in terms of your power, your esteem in Hollywood. And you must be in control of so much. Does anyone ever have the guts to say, Steven Spielberg, you're wrong about this. That's not going to sell. That's a bad movie. All the people I hire to work with me are the ones I only hire them if they'll tell that to my face. <laughs> I'm not interested in anybody you know, you know, lying to me against what they really believe. I mean, that'd be a horrible thing to surround yourself with people who just make you feel good. I mean, I mean I'm happy that if the audience makes me feel good. That's very important to me. But uh, it's very important that when you're working, that you're surrounded by honesty and people with good ideas and people who can make a material contribution to a movie, and I, that's extraordinarily important for me. We're here today also to commemorate the opening of um, a Universal Entertainment Complex mm -hmm. in Florida. But your film career, in some respects, is intricately linked with Universal. A studio tour you took at the age of 17. What happened? That's right. I took a tour when I was uh, 16, actually, and I got off the tour tram because they weren't really showing us shooting. They were racing down the streets of the sound, you know, and mainly showing us the back lot. And I wanted to see some photography happening, some filming. So I left off the bus at a rest stop, and I snuck behind the sound stage, and the bus went on without me. And I spent the day watching a television show that's been shot at Universal. This is a long time ago. You came back to the studio, though, masquerading as somebody working there. Yeah, How did you do that? Yeah, that's the old story. I came back to uh, Universal about a week later and just wore my bar mitzvah suit, you know. <laughs> Literally? So, oh, yeah. It was a little short, wasn't it? Oh, I had. I was a little short at the time. <laughs> <laughs> a little briefcase in my hand and just walked past the guard and waved to him. And his name, he's still at the gate. His name's Scotty. And the guy that you... He's still there. still at the gate, <laughs> Scotty. And he, he waved back. And for, for the next three months during my summer vacation from high school, every day I went to the lot and observed editing and dubbing. And, and just filming. walked around? Yeah, walked around and found a little office to sort of... You got your own office? Well, there was, a, there was a, a, a large building with about 19 vacancies, and I moved into an office, sat there. Uh, the phones were disconnected, so I had to make a deal with the operator to get the phones working again. Uh, but I never really made phone calls. I spent most of my time just watching filmmaking and m mainly made friends with the film editors because the film editors were the only people who wouldn't throw me out. I was thrown out by more directors in those days, <laughs> tossed off of more sets, and I wound up... Uh, uh, you know, meeting a few film editors and really learning the business through editing, which is a great way to learn how to make movies. Can you enjoy your movies when you watch them now, or do you always think, ah, I know what the shot took, I know, I know which take this is. Can you sit back and enjoy the story and the acting and the... Oh, it's hard. It's hard for me. I can enjoy anybody else's movies, <laughs> but I can't enjoy mine. The only movie I've been able to see uh, feeling somewhat disconnected from the experience was is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Why? Raiders, I don't know. It's the only movie I can watch of mine and be entertained by it and not remember what happened behind the scenes, not remember about the snakes, not remember about the bugs and this and that and this and that. The Raiders series for me has been uh, very enjoyable. I mean, I, I, I put on a different hat when I direct those films. I'm totally wearing the hat of the consumer, of the audience. You appear to be, and I'm sure you are, uh, of course I don't know you personally, but I think a lot of people feel this way, to be a wonderful human being and having, have a great sense of values and yet you've got all of this money. You're one of the richest people in Hollywood, in America. What, is, what does money mean to you? I just, it just means a little more freedom for me. It just means that I can you know, go places that otherwise I couldn't go, and I could you know, perhaps even, we could live in more than one city, which is, which is sometimes nice. It's a break from Los Angeles. And, Oh my God, if I didn't have any money at all, I would beg, borrow, and steal to take a break from Los Angeles <laughs> somewhere else for a while. Uh, you know, I, I live also here in New York, and I love it here very much.